I've noticed that some days it's easier to be wound up than it is to wind down. Some days it's easier to be uh, an excitable person than it is to be a peaceful person. Some days, some people like you when you're up or out there than they do when you're quiet, sensitive, contemplative. God created us with all emotions that we might have an expression of devotion to Him in all that we are. So when you're happy and when you're sad, so that when you're down and out or when you're up and joyful, you can rejoice in the Lord always. And you can rejoice in Him in everything. And you can rejoice in Him for who He is. Because, frankly, He is worthy to be rejoiced in for that He brings you through and gives to you all the beauty, the wonder, and the joy that there is in being alive. And sometimes that's pain. Pain can be a good thing. Pain can cause a lot of positive aspects in your life. Because it's meant to be a warning that something is not right. When I sit back on this porch and relax in these chairs that are different than my other chairs that are inside now, steps ahead of God when he's telling you to come back to where he is as opposed to running forward to where you are. So if you do find yourself that way, be still and know that he is God and you can trust in him with all your heart and you can lean not your own understanding that though you may want to be out there up front and in charge and be the limelight, maybe God wants you to step back behind the scenes and be alone with Him. Or there might be somebody opposite stage left that's working and needs your encouragement instead of the thousands that are out there in front of the stage that just needs your performance. In me, peace. There's a vast difference between happiness and blessedness. Paul had imprisonments and pains, sacrifice and sufferings up to the very limit. But in the midst of it all, he was blessed. All the Beatitudes came into his heart and life in the midst of these very conditions. Paganini, the great violinist, came out before his audience one day and made the discovery just as they ended their applause that there was something wrong with his violin. He looked at it a second and then saw it was not his famous and valuable one. He felt paralyzed for a moment, then turned to his audience and told them there had been some mistake. And he did not have his own violin. He stepped back behind the curtain thinking it was still where he left it, but discovered that someone had stolen his and left that old second-hand one in his place. He remained back of the curtain a moment, then came out before his audience and said, Ladies and gentlemen, I will show you that the music is not in the instrument, but in the soul. And he played as he had never played before, until the audience was enraptured with enthusiasm, and applause almost lifted the ceiling off the building. Because the man had revealed to them that music was not in the machine, but his own soul that played the machine. It is your mission, tested and tried one, to walk out on the stage of this world, and to reveal to all earth and heaven that the music is not in conditions, not in things, not in externals, but the music of life is in your own soul. When my wife and I took the time to go on vacation, we took my 
old Alaska truck, a Ford Focus station wagon, 2000, and parked it. We left it here and rented a car and we went off into the wilderness and stayed there and enjoyed it. Had a wonderful time. It was so exciting to be with the Lord and to just relax and not have cell phones and have all the distractions of people and places and things and cars and you name it, emotions and devotions and whatever. But to be alone with God and to camp out, to sit around and do nothing, it was heaven for us and God was there. As a matter of fact, God provided in such a way that when we set up our tent next to the river, I went walking and my wife was sleeping and I found I found a toilet seat that had been attached to a big box that stood up off the ground. And I took a picture of it, but it was back where hunters may have hidden it so that they could use it for when they went out hunting. And so I came back and I told my wife, guess what, follow me. And I showed her, I said, see, the Lord provided for you because my wife, it was out in the woods, she would not be very comfortable without having some type of portable facilities. And we go, we bring a tent, and we sleep in sleeping bags. So, she had a porta potty all set up. Well, the place that we camped next to the river was a popular one of hunters. So when we looked inside the fire pit, there was already a grill there. Wow, that was cool. We used the grill. Likewise, there was already wood stacked. Wonder who did that? Then, that first morning as I woke up before she was awake, I had told her when we packed our stuff to bring, or when we went to the store to buy some things for our camp, I said, just buy some instant coffee. I said, you know, she said, well, we don't have a coffee pot, you know, and I said, don't worry about it. You know, the Lord will provide. And that's what I always tell her, God will provide, because he always has. And so that morning I went walking and I went over the bridge and across the river and I went down the way and I saw another campground. And I went over to, or not campground, but kind of rocks, you know, where there's been a fire pit. We call that a campground in Oregon. <laughs> Woo! A non-paying one. <laughs> you don't pay for these. So I walked over and I saw in the rocks there was a giant pork and beans can or some type of can that was huge, about this big. And they had squished the top Turned the edge, bent it back so that it still had a lid, and you could still bend it back and forth, and it was for boiling water. And it was all blackened on the sides, and so I brought it back and boiled the water and made her a cup of coffee. Because if my wife doesn't have a cup of coffee and her cigarette, as well as visit the facilities, this is not a happy camper, literally. <laughs> Dare I say that? But God knew her and loved her and blessed her. So we enjoyed the goodness of the Lord. And in that, she tells the story now of how God provided. Though I don't know if she tells it as much as I do about the Lord providing, but she does tell it in her own way, in her own shape, in her own form. So when we got back, we waited a day and rested and unloaded the car. And we got in the station wagon and we were taking the rail car back and our car blew up. Oh my God. What are we going to do? Oh no, Mr. Bill. Well, before we had gone camping, I told my wife that, you know, honey, even though we're going camping, I said, you know, and we set the money aside, we still need to remember, I told you, before summer's over, we need to get a car. Because I don't know how much longer that my car will last because, you know, it's been to Alaska and back four or five times. It's been all the way across Canada carrying all of our furniture in it and other possessions. It's been all the way to Cape Cod and back to Sacramento. Oh my God. And it's driven all over the place. Through mountains, roads, and rivers, and sandy beaches, and Pismo. Matter of fact, people laugh at it. And my wife was very embarrassed to drive at times to work because it had been pretty rough, rough, rough driving. 
And yet she loved it in her own way because it had been there for us. God had provided. God had taken care of us. It also got 30 miles a gallon, so I was like pretty thrilled. So, when we got back, we knew we had to have a car. And our car broke down one day before fall. Or was it two days? It was two days before fall. So, my wife and I prayed and we decided to take some money out of a 401k that we knew we'd never retire on. And I told her, I said, go out and buy a car. I said, let the Lord be. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on your own understanding. She hates that scripture because it was the first one she memorized. I taught her that. She doesn't hate it. She lives it. <laughs> She's living with me. She lives it. And so she went down to a car dealer and she looked around and she saw this car that was not so new, but it only had 60,000 miles on it. And it was a Nissan that was not so new, but it was in mint condition. So she came home and she said, well, you know, what do you think of this car? And I said, well, it says worth about, you know, such and such. And she was deflated immediately. <gasps> Bummer. So I told her, I said, well, you know, whatever the Lord, you know, whatever you think is right. I said, trust in the Lord. I said, this is going to be your car this time. I said, I'm, I've had God provide for my car and it ran forever. Much as people were shocked by it. It became a perfect truck. <laughs> and sometimes a home for me. But God wanted to use this as an object lesson for her to learn to trust him and have peace. So she did. She went and she was nervous, but she went ahead and purchased this car and, and she got it home, you know. People began to comment on it and say, wow, you got a great deal. Everyone began to tell her all these things. And as she began to enjoy the car, she began to realize God had provided. God had taken care of her because she had prayed about it and she committed it. And she said it was the Lord's choice. But she still wanted to have that reassurance from other people. And everyone so far to this day has commented on her new car, how she has been blessed by God, how God had provided, and how perfectly where we should have had terror over buying a new car or a used car in these economic times that we live in, God has blessed us. We're not rich, and we're not impoverished. We're poor. We live paycheck to paycheck. But you know, I've lived that for 30 years, and I've been up, and I've been down, and God has always taken me all around. And you know what? God has provided every step of the way. So today, if you really think that you have a problem, that you're facing cancer, you think you're going to die, been there, done that. I was supposed to die at 30. You think that God can't provide for a job? Can't think of a state I'd ever went to that and I've been to quite a few of them where I couldn't find a job. Or you think that you need money? Man, I remember when God provided for me in Israel and I didn't have any money. At all. You think you can't get by? Man, I remember when, you know, I had people walk up and offer to give me money out of nowhere. I hitchhiked starting off from Oregon with my backpack going to Southern California and I had no money and when I got to Southern California I had $200. What a shock. I didn't steal it <laughs> or beg for it or ask for it. People offered it. Scary. So whenever you have anything that you think that you can't give to God or have peace about it, Recognize that Jesus himself, if you would simply ask, seek, and find, you would simply knock and open the door, if you would simply trust in the Lord, yes, with all your heart, and don't lean in your own understanding, he'll show you a way that you never thought of. He'll lead you a path you never could conceive of. He might even take you like a Moses experience and have you part the waters so that you could walk on dry land. Or he may do something even worse. He may take you to a place where he bids you to come to him and walk on water like he did to Peter. And at that point in time, I ask you, do you trust in the Lord with all your heart? My wife does. 